Well, good morning, folks, and welcome to our webinar for today, Keeping Community Choice Energy, or perhaps Keeping the Community in Community Choice Energy, but we recognize a multiplicity of communities in every community, labor community, business community, environmental community, but we landed on Keeping Community in Community Choice Energy, so that is our title today. Thanks for joining us. Uh, your webinar team is myself on the left there, Woody Hastings, a Renewable Energy Manager for the Center for Climate Protection, and Nina Turner, our program associate, is going to help with the uh, questions and answers later in the uh, later in the webinar. And thank you to our sponsor, the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation, for our webinars and for our work on advancing community choice energy in California. Our presenters today are Erica Morgan of the California Alliance for Community Energy. Uh, she's also with the San Diego Energy District Executive Director, uh, and uh, she'll be uh, presenting a, a recent paper that the California Alliance for Community Energy produced. And uh, we have also Jessica Tovar, uh, the leader of the East Bay Clean Power Alliance, which has been the organization uh, really working in the East Bay community to help launch uh, East Bay uh, Community Energy, the Community Choice Agency there in Alameda County. Little housekeeping notes today. So the webinar is being recorded and that will be posted on our Clean Power Exchange website for access. Um, everyone today is in listen only mode. Um, however, uh, we in your um, interface uh, box there, you uh, can enter questions in your control panel at any time. We will uh, do the questions and answers in the last 15 or 20 minutes. And Nina will be helping with that. If you are having any, tr you can't hear me? Can folks hear me? I can I hear you. you. Okay, I'm going to keep going. I just got a signal that I wasn't being heard, but I think that that's a problem here. So uh, if you are having trouble hearing or seeing, we'll try to resolve the issue, um, but uh, we should have a, a good recording for everyone. Um, there are some handouts. Um, and uh, so we have the speaker bios, slide decks, and the paper that California Alliance for Community Energy produced, Guide to Creating state-of-the-art community choice programs. So those are in your control panel. Those will also be uh, available, posted on Clean Power Exchange after the webinar. So I just wanted to say a little bit about uh, our work in community choice energy growth in California. We do host the Clean Power Exchange website and on that website, uh, is an interactive map of all community choice activity in all of the cities and counties in the state of California. We produce a bi-weekly e-news that has news and information about community choice and other related energy issues. And then the website also just contains a lot of resources for folks either wanting to start a community choice agency or uh, uh, you know, working on one that's operational. Um, we host an annual symposium, the Business of Local Energy Symposium. This year, it's coming up in Sacramento on June 5th. Hope folks can attend that. Um, and it's uh, always a very a dynamic opportunity to uh, uh, meet with other folks uh, working on advancing community choice energy and uh, developing means of, as the title implies, uh, you know, advancing uh, localization of clean energy resources. Um, so that's the Business of Local Energy Symposium, and you can visit the it's Center for Climate Protection or Clean Power Exchange website, and there's a, an event link, link for that. We also produce occasionally white papers, so we have those listed on Clean Power Exchange, and then these monthly, uh, monthly webinars. Our next one is gonna be on May 16th, so not exactly monthly all the time, where it looks like we may be skipping April. Um, for a number of scheduling reasons, but uh, May 16th, mark your calendar, 11 a.m. to noon, and the theme will be Community Choice, Power, and Purpose, which is also the theme of the symposium. So talking about, again, how community choice agencies can serve as vehicles for advancing development of distributed energy resources, and our presenters on that will be announced. So check back. 
Um, I did want to just say a little bit about our effort here and the community engagement uh, that went that went on, both from sort of the community uh, uh, advocating for community choice in Sonoma County, as well as the local governments that really did a great job of reaching out to the community as we were in the formation period of Sonoma Clean Power. The, the image here is of May 1st, 2014, the date that uh, the date that the Sonoma Clean Power started serving customers. And you can see there's a, you know, a diverse group of community members there holding up the banner that we had uh, prepared for that day. And um, so this was, uh, this was outside the, the uh, supervisor uh, chambers and it just coincided May 1st was the same day that there was a scheduled uh, uh, meeting of uh, Sonoma Clean Power uh, Board as well as the cutover date for the launch of, of service. So we all went outside and took a photo and there we all are, all kinds of folks, labor, uh, business, uh, regular folks, local government folks came and participated in that day. Um, I decided to put an image of the map up here. This is the map at Clean Power Exchange and you can see uh, the advancement of community choice around the state. One of my favorite things to do is turn turn counties green, and the most recent ones are the Central Coast there, San Benito, Santa Cruz, and, and, and Monterey launched on March 1st. The cutover date was March 1st, so they are now up and running, and you can see all over the state a variety of um, activities, and no, no two are the same, and so there's varying degrees of community engagement, varying degrees degrees of you know community activity that results in community choice agencies forming and varying degrees of the local governments are reaching out to the communities and the stakeholders and letting them know what's going on so I think uh, in our view you know you end up with a better program if you've got uh, if you've got the community engaged in that and we'll, we'll certainly be hearing about that from our presenters just a few fundamentals I wanted to go over about um, about the nature of community choice agencies, and I don't think I'm duplicating some of the stuff that's gonna be presented by Jessica and Erica, which is that just the fundamental uh, reality, and one of the reasons why I gravitated toward community choice is that community choice agencies are public agencies that are, uh, you know, their decision-making meetings are open to the public. And to me, that's a really big deal, especially ones that are uh, emerging uh, today, as opposed to decades ago when, sort of things were a little different in terms of um, community awareness and ability to know what's going on. And so with these agencies launching today with uh, our modern means of sharing information, uh, the opportunities to actually engage and show up and be involved in the decision making, especially as these agencies are forming and getting things into the DNA of a community choice agency about local development and jobs and uh, community benefits is, is super important uh, in my view. So the uh, time-wise, the engagement opportunities are during formation, um, certainly right around the launch, and then during the ongoing operational life. I shouldn't forget that, that the community needs to stay engaged once a community choice agency is up and running. That's not the end of it. It's super important that the community remain uh, engaged and helping to uh, you know, get make, ensure that the community choice agency is 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 really serving the community with the benefits that uh, are possible. And, and and I think as I've already said, it goes both ways: the community engaging with the with the agency, and the agency engaging with um, the community. And I think with that, that's my um, initial presentation. I am going to hand it over to um, uh, to Erica. So Erica, it should switch over to you. Okay. Oops, and Great. there's our that. Can we see yes. that? Yes. I see I see your, your slides. So that looks okay. good. Okay. Super. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that introduction, Woody. That uh, that is my cover slide and shows my um, dual allegiances in this conversation. Uh, as uh, I serve in both capacities. Um, here is also a quick overview of what I'm going to cover, talking about uh, the guide um, and uh, a little bit more about the history of the guide, but then going into more detail on three specific engagement factors that, that Woody set up very well. Um, okay. And then I'm going to, can Erica, everybody hear me? Erica, before, yeah. you, 
before you continue, can you go ahead and click on that little, um, there's a little icon to go to full screen. I, you're, you're not in full screen. So if you could do that, that would be great. Uh, I'm not sure where that is actually. It's on your PowerPoint uh, system. And oh, um, well, it's not it. So there's a little nope. it's an image of a screen. How's that? Go. Okay, that's now better. I got it. That's better. Oh, well, hang on. Okay. All right. Can everybody see me okay now? Yes. Okay, great. All right, then <laughs> technical uh, uh, elements like that not being my strong suit, let's proceed uh, and move right into just a few words of introduction here. Um, I want to just uh, by way of getting into the subject, acknowledge that I come at it from a particular point of view. I have been a specialist in managing change, both in small groups and larger ones, for quite a long time. And that includes boards and startups, um, but it also includes some market transformation work back in the day. I've been working in and around the renewables industry since well before there was an industry. Um, and I started working in choice in the late 1999, 2000s in New England when uh, it actually was retail, you know, opt-in market-based choice. And we built the first aggregation for 100% renewable energy back in the state of Maine in the year 2000. So I've been a fan of this approach for a while, but not, uh, uh, let me just say, coming to California, you know, and learn quickly how much more powerful our model is out here. Uh, San Diego Energy District was created in 2011 uh, to put community choice on the radar screen on the public agenda here in San Diego. And that's a picture of our founder and uh, his compatriots at the first community choice conference in San Diego in 2012. Um, and now the California Alliance for Community Energy, for which I also uh, serve as operations coordinator, this is a network of grassroots uh, individuals and groups, um, all concerned about community choice and supporting it, but also doing so for the advancement of the mission shown there on the screen. We're looking for um, a, a form of community choice uh, that actually ensures that the benefits of this powerful model, uh, benefits in terms of uh, not just environmental benefits, but economic and social justice benefits, actually reach our communities. So that's core to what the Alliance does. Um, and it was from that, that perspective that the Alliance uh, developed and released this guide. Um, so in 2017, we focused on a number of specific things we wanted to do, three priorities, and this was the, the first and um, in some ways I would argue one of the more important priorities because it really starts to um, build a, uh, a body of knowledge around how to be sure that we keep the community in community choice. It's the beginning of our discussion about best practices. Uh, and we want to highlight those practices that uh, improve the probability that we'll get the results we want. So this guide, which is available, as Woody said, in your download uh, portal there, is freely available for copying to everyone. It has three chapters. It starts with the values and the principles. What do we actually mean by this kind of community choice? It's all spelled out there. The second chapter provides some detailed organizing steps that I'm going to say a little bit more about as we uh, concentrate on that. Um, and then the third chapter really looks at some key operational issues that new and you know, emerging community choice programs will be uh, finding themselves confronting. And I've put on here that it's volume one, our best practices series, that may be a little bit premature to describe it that way. But nonetheless, this is a focus, best practices for uh, community-centric community choice programs. This is something that the Alliance is going to continue to be working on, including uh, this coming year as well. Okay, then um, let's get to the page to switch here. How do I do that? Okay, so um, this is a tool that I, 
I use when talking about community choice generally, it's a roadmap to implementation uh, focused uh, on introducing to folks who really know very little about CCA, how do we get there? So it's deliberately very simplified. The point I wanted to make in this setting was that each stage has, a, has critical tasks that we need to complete, and it ends with a major milestone. And I wanted to start by placing these engagement factors in that context. So the first, stage one, this is when the pu public discussion begins, in the grassroots usually, and the core objective is ensuring that the public will exists to take the public actions that we need to take. And this stage ends when some of those critical decisions have been made around uh, the shape of the program. Will it be one jurisdiction or more than one jurisdiction? Uh, stage two is about confirming that political will. This is when the final go-ahead votes need to occur, whether it's one community or whether those votes are going to occur in multiple communities as they do under a JPA model. After these six votes have been successful, that's when we know that the choice program is actually coming. Prior to that point, it's hypothetical. It's a debate. It's something we hope will happen, but it's not confirmed. And in step three, the program starts to get designed. There are perhaps some key hires, some uh, RFPs for service providers, uh, staff on board, all of that begins to get sorted out. But how these services are defined is a critical question. And does the community get a voice in those questions? That's where the community advisory committee is a vital factor by that time, if not before. I'm not gonna spend any time on stages four and five, not because engagement activities don't matter here as they absolutely do, and uh, Woody's already alluded to that, but because I wanna underscore the critical need to have robust community engagement at the start. This is really how we keep community in community choice by making sure that the community's representatives are engaged and at the table. Okay, so next I'm gonna start going through these one at a time. And the first one is building the building the alliance itself. Hang on just a second, I gotta here. Um, the breadth of this coalition is vital. Um, if environmentalists are the only group that are for it, well, then it's easy to discount them. And in fact, we see that happening in some areas. By building a very strong and broad group, uh, we establish and ensure the political will. We give coverage to the electeds if they run into pushback. The broader the alliance, the more likely it is that there's a supportive argument for every perspective. So the breadth of this coalition, this alliance, uh, is make it or break it for CCA organizing. And that's why the guide spends a whole chapter outlining eight critical steps to organizing. And these emphasize and start with building that alliance. And they talk about how. And it really boils down to reaching out to groups that might not think they have an interest here and educate, educate, educate. Uh, helping them understand how they do. Social justice groups might not initially understand how community choice can help them meet their objectives, but it's a case that can very easily be made if we sit down and explain that. Um, and of course, the, the breadth and the diversity of this group is, is critical at the start. So a couple of examples here, and I, this is where I can get lost in time. So I'm not going to, I'm going to go through these kind of quickly. Some strong alliances. Clearly, Jessica is going to tell us about what's happened in East Bay. So I don't need to say much about that. But San Diego is uh, trying to replicate that broad success through the San Diego Community Choice Alliance. We've brought together faith leaders, electeds, businesses, local planning groups, all good. Um, a, uh, a somewhat more uh, risky proposition is uh, what's happening in the Coachella Valley area where desert community energy has been generally seen as a creation of the staff of Coachella Valley Association of Governments. There is not a, much of an alliance there. It was due to launch in 2018, however, didn't get its implementation plan in by the arbitrary deadline of December. So now they're on hold till 2019. My worry for them is how will this effort be defended if detractors materialize over the next year and there is no broad coalition 
to defend that effort. Um, okay, factor number two, getting here, the guiding principles. Um, this is another tool to use to deepen the explanation of what we want to happen and why we want it. Uh, and in San Diego, the uh, uh, Community Choice Alliance principles start with number one, saying community choice should provide San Diego families and businesses a choice of electricity provider and local control of their energy destiny. So when it comes time to evaluate the competing proposals that the city of San Diego has facing it, it becomes pretty clear which one Alliance members want. Will the proposals submitted by uh, our uh, investor-owned utility um, provide a choice of provider? <laughs> Will that proposal allow local control? Well, uh, so the guiding principles provide a way to evaluate proposals. Uh, they can be enshrined in several different forms. In Solana Beach, their uh, uh, choice um, proponent for a long time was the Clean and Green Committee, which spearheaded a lot of community discussions under the motto of zero emissions, zero waste, water wise. That was their touchstone, and it took them strongly in the right direction. Um, in all cases, having clear principles does several things for community engagement, provides a rationale for a broader inclusion in the coalition. If people want the things represented by the principles, they're more likely to support actions to get there. They also serve a defensive purpose. So when those actions come under attack, the coalition can come to the defense. So for example, no way will the San Diego Community Choice Alliance be supportive of any proposal that puts at risk our target of 100% renewables by 2035. Um, and lastly, as I've already alluded, the principles provide a way, um, touchstones and metrics for actually evaluating our options. Is this proposal going to get us any closer to where we want to be, 100% renewables by 2035? Um, and let's see, how am I doing on time? And get to the next slide here, factor three. Um, uh, the Community Advisory Board. So as Woody has said, community choice programs are public entities. So yes, they're transparent, it should be, but open meetings aren't in themselves enough. Uh, a community advisory committee or a council or however it gets titled is a core best practices, uh, 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 a best practice for keeping community and community energy. And how that group is structured really matters. Uh, is the mandate one, for example, where the group can only be narrowly focused on one topic like community relations or procurement? Or is the mandate broader? Can the advice and the comment from the advisory committee look at all aspects of the program's operations? Do members have defined terms? or do they serve at the pleasure of who, the CEO or the board chair? And what is the selection process and is it transparent and fair? Or are members handpicked by CEA, uh, CCA staff or, or leadership? Or are they nominated to represent particular constituencies? Are they appointed? Whatever this process is, it surely needs to be spelled out. And in particular, the composition. How diverse is it? Uh, does it cover perspective as well as geography? And does it in fact reflect and represent the same breadth of folks who are in the supporting coalition? The guide stresses all this and says in the formation period, organizers should be thinking and looking for people who have the interest, the time and the motivation to consider serving as members of their community advisory committee. So when it comes time to make a proposal to the, to the formation of this committee or to submit nominations uh, or encourage applicants to apply, we have folks ready and willing to do so. So I have a couple of examples here. 
Um, a couple of examples first of starting off on the right foot. Uh, and I would nominate for that Peninsula Clean Energy, which committed to forming a citizens advisory committee early and fulfilled that commitment. That's their banner at the top. Uh, PCE started serving customers in San Mateo County in October of 2016, but by that time, its community advisory committee had been meeting since May, so for five months. Um, that committee has 15 members with three-year terms. Vacancies are posted right at this, this website here. Application materials, screening method, objectives, roster, meeting schedule, agendas, meeting materials are all clearly posted. Um, the second example is East Bay Community Energy. And again, I'm going to leave details of that to Jess. But again, they are also just starting service, but it's Community Advisory Committee is also posted in transparent. The membership is identified on that website page, my second banner there. Um, and lastly, a third example is a little bit more of a story, and then I'm going to uh, be done here. Um, but I want to use this, this opportunity to applaud the coalition in Monterey County for their recent success at getting agreement on a better, more inclusive, community reflective. Uh, advisory committee. Um, and this starts, this story starts with the original proposal for a citizens advisory committee that came from the staff. The structure featured two groups, one group that would focus on key accounts and a second more ad hoc group for residential customers. Both of these groups were very narrowly focused and largely staff nominated. But there's a good broad coalition in Monterey County now with green power and a broad alliance that includes farm workers, labor representative, transportation, economic development folks, climate action folks, the Progressive Action Network, and many more. So this group designed a counterproposal, uh, and they got consensus among themselves on what they were looking for. During that process, they reached out to members of the Monterey Bay Governing Board and explained what they were seeking and why. Uh, and from this constructive dialogue, a work group session was held with uh, Monterey Bay Community Power staff who reviewed both of their, their proposal and the Alliance's proposal. They essentially merged those two proposals, keeping much that the Green Power Alliance was seeking, including a broader mandate, clear terms, transparent selection process, et cetera. The amended process was presented at a board meeting and the Alliance was generally happy with the revised proposal, but they sought four modest changes, which because of the relationships they had built with board members and the conversations that occurred along that process, those four changes were proposed and accepted um, and the result is that uh, Monterey Bay Community Powers Community Advisory Committee is now open for business and looks to be a good, strong vehicle for involving the community voice in their activities. Um, okay, I think at 17 minutes, I'm going to stop there and turn it over to to uh, to Jessica or to Woody or to in, in, introduce Jessica and just leave it at that. I'm open to questions afterwards. Right, great. Thank you very much, Erica. Excellent presentation. And right, folks, for anybody that joined late, uh, please do enter your questions in your control panel at any time. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I'm in the middle of doing sort of two things at once here. Um, so when I put the control back to myself, oh, there I am. Um, and so, so yeah, you know, uh, really great detail. You know, I read that report, the guide, as soon as it, pretty much as soon as it landed in my inbox, I really recommend it to folks. Um, you know, it goes into great detail um, about really the engagement sort of back and forth and circling back. And, you know, you can't just meet with certain folks once and call it a day. You got to really sort of do more than that and that's really spelled out in the guide and really great job um, in the guide and in the presentation you just gave i'm really glad you gave some examples there um, 
And one thing I just wanted to say um, is that, Erica, you, you, you never sort of mentioned that the community advisory committees are not a given. Uh, a com there's no nothing in the statute that requires a community choice agency to even have a community advisory committee. So it is, uh, in, in some cases, unless the leadership uh, does it itself, decides to do that and follow that best practice, um, you know, it's up to the community to make sure that a community advisory committee gets um, gets established. Um, yep. All right, That's so very good point. I'm going to hand over way. the keyboard and mouse to you, um, Jessica. You should have control of the screen now with your opening slide there. Okay. Um, let me click here so that okay. Now you see the little arrows in the bottom there that you can use. Yeah. There we okay. Go. All right. Awesome. Um, so what I'm sharing with you today, just first really quick, um, I'm actually, my background is environmental justice organizer. Um, so I came on to the Local Clean Energy Alliance in the beginning of 2015. So I've been doing this for the last three, three plus years. Um, and the slideshow that I'm sharing with you all is the same slideshow we use to kind of uh, educate and begin having a conversation about community choice, what it is, what we, what needs we have in the community, um, how does this relate to other issues. So, um, you know, obviously the first slide is to talk about where our electricity comes from. Um, and for the East Bay area, the, the IOU or the corporate, I, I like to refer to it as the corporate energy uh, monopoly. <laughs> uh, PG&E is who services um, the East Bay area. So let's see if I can. Oh, great. So we'll have a discussion about that. Usually people will be like, yeah, PG&E is who provides our energy. Um, and we start talking about, well, what are the issues with that? Um, and just recognizing that, you know, um, our PG&E bill is a, a endless revolving debt um, that affects, you know, our our budgets. Um, and then we talk about how there really just is no um, choice in the matter um, and no engagement in, in our relationship to Pacific Gas and Electric. Um, and we talk about how this impacts our communities. Um, and oftentimes people share stories of having, you know, um, shutoffs of energy or um, recognizing that your bill or your rates for energy are always going up um, every year. And so we have conversations with communities um, about that. Um, so we start talking about, you know, our current energy structure and what that means in our communities. And oftentimes we're, we're, we're talking to community members who live in um, environmentally um, unjust communities by large, um, medium and small industrial pollu polluting facilities. And oftentimes these are energy fa facilities like fossil fuel power plants, for example. Um, but also having a discussion about how those polluting industries also contribute to global climate change. Um, another thing that we also talk about um, is the that a lot of energy that is bought off of the market um, is is often comes from um, well, there's different sources, but some of it, the clean part, <laughs> it comes from solar farms. And so we do have a discussion about how, Solar farms are often far away, not in our community, um, are often in desert communities, um, noting that these job opportunities are outsourced, the money is outsourced out of our communities, um, but also acknowledging that we're constantly being inundated with messages of put it in the desert, there's nothing there, when in fact, there are desert communities um, and habitats that are affected by these large uh, solar farms. So another thing we talk about um, is that we're not just paying for our electricity, but we're also paying for that in infrastructure um, and recognizing that we're paying um, money 
for having that energy um, brought in from far away through transmission lines. And so we asked the question, well, who all pays for this? Um, and everybody <laughs> knows the answer. We do. And so then we asked the question, well, who benefits from this infrastructure? They do. Pacific Gas and Electric or whatever corporation is that's providing your electricity in your community. Um, so we talk about community choice energy and community choice energy, you really have to get into the weeds of what it is to really, um, to, so that community members can understand what's going on. Because you have to understand, we're talking about people who are paying a bill and have no other relationship to their source of electricity and energy. Um, so we refer to community choice energy as an alternative where we decide the best sources for our electricity for our community. Um, and we talk about how um, we have this policy in the state of California, AB 117, that started in 2002. Um, so people have a background of how that went down, but also recognizing that we didn't really actually get a community choice energy off the ground until about 2010 um, with um, marine clean energy. Um, so some people already might have heard of that particular program, and so sometimes that comes up too. So it's really important to share with folks like how community choice is structured, and we often refer to it as a hybrid system, recognizing that um, PG&E, the investor-owned utility, they procure the power, they own the infrastructure, and then they provide the billing. And then there's this also this um, example, uh, City of Alameda has its own public power um, where they, they procure the power, they own their infrastructure, and then they provide customer service. Well, community choice is somewhere in the middle. Um, the Community Energy Authority, um, it, the board made up of elected officials sets rates and designs the programs, um, but PG&E, our corporate energy provider still owns and maintains the transmission lines and the infrastructure and still provides billing. So we make it clear that you're still gonna get a bill from PG&E, but your line item for electricity will now come from your community choice energy. And in the case of Alameda County, it would say East Bay Community Energy. Um, so we get into, um, after understanding what community choice energy is, is actually talking about our local program that we actually help uh, establish. Um, and actually, like I said, I have only been uh, with Local Clean Energy Alliance um, for the last three years. Uh, prior to that, there was another organizer, Colin Miller, um, who did a lot of the footwork around finding who was going to um, kind of take on uh, community choice. So there were attempts, there were attempts at the um, East Bay mud to try to start a community choice and then that didn't work out. And then there was an attempt with um, city of Oakland and then that didn't work out. Um, so eventually we were able to um, get the Al Alameda County Board of Supervisors to um, move forward with a feasibility study to start a community choice program. So we're talking to the community about the timeline is that this program is actually launching this year for commercial and municipal accounts um, in June. And then there's a different timeline for residential, um, but there will be about uh, 100 residents that will be part of a volunteer group um, this June. So next slide. Um, so this is the part where we get into like what's really important to us, um, putting that community in community choice and really talking about our visions and our needs in our community. So I'm gonna try to make sure we don't run out of time here, um, but we like to make the distinction between market purchase um, and, and the actual benefits of having local renewables. Um, so what we say is that like the market is unstable, rates are always going up, um, there's no guarantee of greenhouse gas reduction. It's important for us to move forward with integrating local renewables for this price stability, the economic development in our communities, the creation of 
clean energy jobs, um, and actual true reduction of pollution that causes climate change. Um, so we really make it clear that, you know, this is an example of what we want to see more in our community. And here are some solar panels in Oakland on top of the Oakland Athletic Club. Um, so setting our goals for community benefits, this was really important to us because um, this is where we're able to address how electricity, how energy affects different sectors of the community. So we emphasize a lot of education, engagement, um, and empowerment, and specifically um, targeting low-income people and people of color and having these events in their communities. Um, so one of our goals is competitively priced electricity, having more stable rates than our current corporate energy provider. Um, inclusive representation. So this is a photo of Alameda County's uh, Community Advisory Committee that's made up of different members of our community and different allies um, in the work that we do, from labor to social justice to environmental. Um, we even have a procurement person on there, which has been helpful too, because she's in the weeds of what procurement is like on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and a wide range of folks with different political agendas, which is very interesting. Um, so one of our other goals is to do better than PG&E, do better than the corporation, and do better than the California state mandates. Um, another one of our goals is prioritizing local renewables in our community. Um, and we advocated for a local development business plan that the Board of Supervisors agreed to move forward with um, of kind of a roadmap of how to integrate those local renewables over time so that we're not completely reliant on market purchase energy. Another one of our goals um, is clean energy and energy efficiency jobs, family sustaining wage union and long term jobs with justice. So we did make a lot of connections um, with a lot of people who represent workforce development, ra racial equity, um, and a lot of cooperative small business, businesses of color um, along the way. So another one of our goals is community ownership and control of renewables. Um, for the resiliency, for the equitable economic development, um, and, you know, because we our communities, low-income communities and communities of color also, too, gain to um, benefit from local clean energy. Number seven goal is improving health and safety. Um, imp improving health and safety in the community and also improving um, the health and safety of workers. So we wrap it up in talking about how community choice is a path to our solution for all these reasons. Now keep moving forward um, so we can get to questions. These are just some images from some of our workshops, gatherings, some of our tabling at Earth Days and different events, talking to the community about community choice. Um, and we always use the hashtag clean power to the people. Um, a lot of our events are called clean power to the people. So this is just some images of some of our allies, uh, California Nurses Association, so a lot of labor groups, um, IBEW 595, some faith leaders in California, as well as um, here you have social physicians for social responsibility. Um, so people who are trying to advocate for health um, as well as health of the environment. Um, so one of the things I want to go over just really quick is what we did is we signed on these different organizations and allies um, to help us advance these goals within our program, really advocated for community representation. And just to be clear, we were actually advocating for our community leaders to be on the board with the electeds. Um, but it was a compromise to actually get a community advisory committee. What we were able to get is our chair of the community advisory committee sits with the electeds on the board as a non-voting member because that is what the state um, allows, um, the state law. 
Um, and in 2017, we continued signing on organizations um, with the intent of be making the commitment to see this through, that we do get um, you know, local development in our communities um, and enforce those commitments that we won back in 2016, watchdog the process and continue our education um, in the design of the program of East Bay Community Energy. Okay, so we also just go over how, you know, community choice is actually benefiting everybody. Everybody stands to, to benefit um, from this program. So I'm trying to wrap it up quick. This is just some logos from our different efforts, Clean Energy and Jobs Oakland. We were trying to get Oakland to start a community choice program. I'm the coordinator of the East Bay Clean Power Alliance, um, which formed um, Alameda Countywide Alliance in 2014 when, when Alameda County Board of Supervisors agreed to move forward with starting a community choice energy program. We're almost done. Okay. And that's it. So this is um, staff from the local Clean Energy Alliance and that's the people that I work with. Um, and we're actually a really small organization. We have three part-time paid staff and the rest of everybody else is just uh, volunteers. Um, so we're, we're kind of like the little engine that could <laughs> and we exist because of donations to our organization. So thank you everybody. I look forward to your questions. Well, great. Thank you very much uh jessica and yes folks now would be the time to enter your kind of lost my cursor here uh enter your questions in the control panel where'd my cursor go okay there it is all right back to me <clears throat> um and let's see where's my presentation uh should be back to me here um Jessica, I'll start off with a question, if I may, um, folks, I'd like to, if I may, which is, you mentioned renewables quite a bit there, and um, I know that the leadership of, uh, of, um, of Sonoma Clean, of, of East Bay Community Energy is very interested in other energy resources, in particular, um, the, uh, electrification of transportation and electric vehicles. And so I'm just wondering if, to what extent um, the Clean Power Alliance has been really talking about some of these other distributed energy resources, electric vehicles and getting those into low income communities and multi-unit dwellings and storage and just the other technologies. Um, is that something you're also talking about when you engage with East Bay Community Energy? I personally have not um, have not really been talking about that, although that comes up a lot in our workshops when we're having dialogues with community members, um, people who are really interested in the electrification um, of, of transportation comes up a lot. And that is something that definitely we support and is an example of what we see as, as being able to do in our community. Um, and in terms of vehicles, you know, it depends what space we're in because oftentimes we're talking to people who aren't really in the bracket of being able to purchase um, an electric vehicle or a hybrid, for example. So that, you know, it just depends on who, what's the makeup of the room um, that we're having this dialogue with. So. We have various kind of opinions in, of all kinds of things come up, um, which makes for a very interesting conversation, but we do make those connections. Okay, great, thanks for that. Nina, um, I'm hoping we've got some questions that have come in. Can, are you still there? Yes. Okay, so the first one is aimed at both of you actually. Um, can either of you speak about the challenges for rural areas to join and or create a CCA? Do you have any advice for these rural communities to gain their own renewable power and participate in the CCA? Um, this is 
This is Erica. I would just venture that I, I empathize with them. It is a challenge. Uh, the uh, difficulty of finding kindred spirits when everyone is quite distant and communities are small is, is, is multiplied. I would acknowledge that. I think, though, that there are networks that allow us to connect like-minded uh, advocates together with the, uh, the California Alliance for Community Energy being one, but so too are Sierra Club and a lot of the other groups, the 350 groups that are out there and do have very large footprints. Um, so I think that it's possible, although time takes time, it takes time and commitment to network within those groups and to be basically put in touch with folks who might have an interest in joining in your efforts. Yeah, and I would just add to that, like I, you know, this is not, we're not working in a rural community. However, Alameda County is very huge um, and it's difficult sometimes for our countywide alliance to come together face to face. So what's been very helpful is being able to have conference calls. Um, so that's how we've been able to stay in touch on a monthly basis um, and then have, you know, our regulars meet on a weekly basis via phone. Okay, and this is kind of related to what you were just saying, but um, do either of you see any challenges in maintaining effective community engagement as CCAs continue to grow in size? So this is kind of referring to how big Clean Power Alliance of SoCal is. Um, is there an optimal CCA size? How do you really continue to engage with a bigger community like this? Um, well, for us, we've, like I said, we meet monthly. Um, we have a coordinating committee that meets weekly um, and is constantly in communication via email. Um, so yeah, it is, it is definitely um, a challenge. Um, and I think one of the things that's helpful for us, um, but gets complicated is when we actually have our face-to-face -face meetings or gatherings, so we used to actually have them more frequently, and I think that's very helpful, um, is to have, like in past, we used to have them every three months, um, and those were the events that we would call Clean Power to the People, and it was a way for people to engage and come together in person um, to get updates on what's going on, because um, not everybody, because we really focus on leadership in the community, not everybody is just solely paying attention to community choice. They're paying attention to, you know, immigrant raids. They're paying attention to housing issues. We're fighting gentrification, you know, here in the Bay Area. So there's so many issues that people are un in inundated with. Um, so that's that's also been a challenge for us. Yeah, I I agree with Jessica in in both points that it's hard to maintain a focus across a lot of different issues uh, and, the, and the importance of using all of our um, electronic means and having regular calls. I think with regard to the Clean Power Alliance and the size of that, uh, it's going to be important for the specific communities that participate to uh, have organizations and advocates within that community that work in the context of the uh, um, uh, governing board of that alliance uh, and work with and uh, build relationships with their governing board members. Those, uh, those people, those individuals are going to be, and they are the one uh, opportunity for each of those communities to speak into that giant alliance that is this new uh, California Power Alliance. Um, and by networking both within the communities and then across communities, you have a, an opportunity to build the kind of um, political voice that will speak to that entity as a whole. It's gonna be a challenge because so many communities are involved. And again, I, in my view, the most effective networking is gonna be at the grassroots level in individual communities and then shared across um, communities of, of like-minded interest. And then on the opposite side of this, um, I have a person who's trying to start um, 
the city of Nevada City to achieve 100% renewable electricity by a certain year. Um, would you say the feasibility of setting up a CCA in a smaller town is slightly easier than something big like the Clean Power Alliance? Well, I'll uh, jump in there and speak to the experience of Solana Beach, which has about 13,000 residents. So it's a, a pretty small community. But what that enabled them to do was to do a lot of education over time, such that uh, when the city did poll its um, citizens, which it did early in the uh, decision-making process, there was a very high degree of support for community choice. People had heard about it and they were supportive. And that enabled that community to go forward with a number of sort of decision-making steps, all of which were, were very prudent and have led them to launch the first uh, community choice program in San Diego County. So it can be done by small communities. And in fact, I would suggest that sometimes the educational and outreach task is much more manageable. You can get your arms around it in a smaller community more easily than you can with the large scale alliance, which is a group of communities all uh, with disparate interests. And I've noticed recently with new CCAs popping up, there's been a lot of opposition to it just based on the fact that people don't really know about it because they didn't have a say in the CCA popping up. So for communities that are just sending out notices in the mail, would you suggest to them it's better to have a lot more community events and reaching out to the community face to face rather than just sending notices in the mail that this is happening? <laughs> Jessica, I'll let you go first, but then I certainly have a thought on that one too. Yeah, that's definitely important to have, you know, be present in the community and make connections with people and really emphasize that supporting a local program is very important because you are keeping that wealth in the community. Um, and if, you know, trying to get people to engage, I think is very important. Like what we do is, is get them engaged. Like tonight we're bringing <laughs> a lot of our members and allies to speak to the board on the emphasis of local clean energy development. Um, so yeah, that's important. Um, and just to pick up on that, I think it's vital that there be an effort to educate the community, whether that's done from the grassroots up or from the city and the staff down, because I think that the uh, success of the program uh, or certainly the support, the political support for the program is much is much shakier if you don't do that. Uh, and uh, in the instance where um, during the development process, uh, objections start to appear, perhaps just out of ignorance, out of misinformation, or possibly because they've heard something that isn't exactly true from some uh, anti-CCA force, and let's be honest, they are out there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in that case, those programs are much more vulnerable because they do not have the kind of grassroots support that will come to defend the program and come to say, this is, this is why we think this is important to do. If people don't understand what the benefits are they, and don't come to defend it, then it seems to me that that program is, is at risk. And, and we, we've talked about some of the tools, some of the important of principles and of community advisory boards and of local development plans. All those are tools of engagement that keep the community's uh, representatives actually at the table. Um, and actually pr improve the probability that the program will have the benefits that the public wants to see and therefore will be successful in those terms. Well, hey, on that really good point, I want to um, thank both of you, Jessica and Erica, for presenting today. That's uh, really all the time we have for questions and answers. Folks, if your question, if you uh, uh, put in a question and it didn't get answered, we'll be happy to follow up. Um, with you uh, afterward and get your question answered. Just uh, again, some dates and reminders. Uh, the next uh, Lean Energy US uh, market call is going to be on uh, Friday, April 13th at 10 a.m. Those are always uh, wonderful information packed uh, um, uh, webinars uh, with um, updates on the development of community choice in the state of California. 
Our next one will be on May 16th, Wednesday, May 16th at 11 a.m. And um, don't forget the Business of Local Energy Symposium in Sacramento on June 5th. Um, and that's my contact information. If, if you uh, have any comments, questions, or concerns, uh, or if you would like to suggest a future webinar topic, we are happy to entertain those ideas. Um, so thanks again, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, Jessica and Erica. Great job. Um, so enjoy the rest of the day, everyone. And thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.